My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome back to FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and of course, FOMO Sapiens 24-7. Topic today is, I love this topic because, I don't know, everything feels important right now. And so I wanted to talk about how you can be a leader when the stakes are high. Now, obviously, if everything feels important, then nothing is important. So disregard what I just said, but you get my point. You sort of have to figure out what's important and then lean into leading on the things that really matter, which is not easy to do. It's not easy because I don't know about you guys. I feel like it's busy. I hate people who say they're busy. I I don't want to be that guy, but I feel very busy right now. And so this conversation was particularly meaningful to me because it just helped me to start to parse through like prioritization and just stepping up and leading when it matters. And my guests to do that, to help us think through this are David Noble and Carol Kaufman. And these two are some pretty high level coaches. They're definitely leaders in their field and they are the authors of this new book. It's called Real-Time Leadership, Find Your Winning Moves When the Stakes Are High. It's out from Harvard Business Review Press out now, actually. You can go pick it up. Let me tell you a little bit more about David and Carol. So David Noble has more than 20 years of global experience advising CEOs, their teams, and major investors on leadership and strategy, and another 15 years as a top executive. He was named by Thinkers 50 as one of the world's top coaches. Impressive. Carol Kaufman is known internationally as a leader in the field of coaching, and Marshall Goldsmith, who has been on the show, as you will recall, named her the number one leadership coach, number one. That's pretty good too. Thinkers 50 ranked her among the top eight coaches in the world, and she has more than 40,000 hours of client contact and works with global CEOs and their teams. She's also, just because she has, you know, all the time, she has so much free time, she's an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. Holy moly. Okay, so very impressive people. You'll see, they're awesome. And you're gonna learn a lot. You're gonna learn about choosing when the stakes are high, like figuring all out, like what do you want to do when things matter? It's just all about decision making today, right? And we love decision making on the show. How do we respond to those big moments? We're going to talk, just get get like the advice of these very experienced coaches. They've seen it all and they will share some of the things that they have observed and learned. And I got to tell you, people like this, they, they see the patterns, right? Because they've met with so many high performers that they're able to start just giving us like the good nuggets that they have been able to tease out over the years. So I really appreciate that about this conversation. And finally, we're just going to get their theory of leadership in the moments that matter. So this is a winner of an episode. You're going to love it. And I will ask for you, my small ask of the episode, because this is such a good one, please consider rating the show and reviewing it. It means so much to me. Those reviews always count. They help people. People go check out the show and they're like, there's nine reviews. They're like, well, this isn't real. If there's 9,000, they're like, that's pretty good. So if you do love the show, please please consider giving me a rating and a review. All right, my small ask is concluded. And now on to the interview. As you know, I like to start every interview with the same question. So I started by asking David this, what's a formative decision you've had to make to get to where you are today? I think the most important decision that I made was in the last 10 years when I decided to become a coach. And I have to say, it actually has a lot to do with FOMO. So when I was in my career as an operating executive and then as a strategist, for me, for many years, it was all about uh, got to be more, it's got to be bigger, faster, higher, stronger. And then there was a time where that just wasn't doing it for me anymore. And I was at a little bit of a crossroads. And then I had this insight that I really wanted to be a coach so that I could help other people. Because when I look back on my life, that was the thing that gave me the most moment in my career. So it was just an interesting crossroads at that point, and that gave me the impetus to to kind of move ahead and be a coach, which was a big break in my career, big difference. It's like me. not everybody gets to figure out what they want to do. So, lucky you. All right, Carol, what what do you what, what's your thought on this one? 
Okay. So for me, you know, when you think of, of FOMO, it's like, I am what other people think of me. And it's often hard to know what you think of you and what you want. So for me, it goes back to when I was um, just in my 20s. And I had been a singer, a singer-songwriter. And I was going back and forth between, do I want to be a singer or a psychologist? And I had my first coaching experience, which was when I was asked to present somewhere on on psychology. And I said, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. And he said, well, you're going to do a presentation. It's going to be half concert, half lecture, and you are going to tell us how you made the decision. To which I said, but I haven't made it yet. And he said, you will by then. So I started scanning back over what really was important to me, what mattered to me. And I had done some very big gigs. Um, there was a guy, Phil Oaks, that um, I sang with him and did. And so I had that experience where you're looking at the balcony, balcony, balconies, and you're singing to the light. And that would be, if I wanted to be a singer, that would be it. But then I went up to Bates College and someone had forgotten to do the PR. So I arrive, the equipment, whatever. We go into the big auditorium and there's like 30 people. And I'm like, okay, this is not going to work. And so get the equipment, go out to a porch, everybody squished together. And I start singing. And there were four young women. And as I was singing my songs, they tears were going down their cheeks. And that was the most important concert to me. And I realized if that is what mattered to me the most, I want to be a psychologist and then a coach and not a singer. Wow. That's a, that's a great story. And by the way, I love the name check to Bates College in Lewiston, Maine, in the great state of Maine. So before we started this conversation, we were just all chatting in the green room and uh, we got onto the topic of FOMO. And I was telling you guys a story about FOMO. And before we talk about your book, which is out now, let's just, I, I, you had some really, both of you had interesting insights on FOMO, which I think you know, it would be great to frame up a conversation about leadership. So Carol, I want to start with you. Talk about this study that you, that you mentioned to me, because I, I really, I, I had not heard about it and I thought it was pretty, pretty interesting. Okay. So um, actually real-time leadership and FOMO are very much joined in that if you want to make the most of every moment, you better know what you want. And many of us are not trained to do that. So there was a, a study at um, Harvard Business School and it was based on Bob Keegan, who's there, who talks about adult development and stages of thinking. The first is, well, in grown-ups, is socialized self, which is I am what other people think of me, and that matters. And then there's self-authored. So socialized self gives you a three, self-authored, which I know what I think, and I'm self-authored, that's a four. Self-transformative is when you go beyond that and can have the capacity to doubt yourself. So they come into Harvard, you get a subject-object interview, and basically the community gets about a 3.1. So they're socialized plus a teeny bit. Okay, fine. Then they graduate and everybody's all excited. What are they now? And they came out as like a 3.1 or a 3.2. And it's like all that training and they now know how to ping off other people, but not necessarily to be thinking internally as much. Smart, but not that, as opposed to, although I'm not a huge proponent of the military, when they did the same thing at West Point, they came in at a three and they went out as a four. And a lot of that was because of the kind of training that you get where you have to be very self-reliant as well as depend on others. I think I went down. I, I went down to a 2.9 when I was in business school. <laughs> All right, and David, what's your take on this whole situation? <laughs> well, I think what Carol said was very wise. And um, I have a point that is related but different to that. So when, when I think of um, FOMO, what immediately comes to mind is just my own experiences and kind of frantically consuming and experiencing everything that I possibly can and hoping for great things out of that. So in, in Buddhism, that's called um, the hungry ghost. So a hungry mm -hmm. ghost is someone who can never be filled up, no matter what their experience is, no matter what they consume, no matter what they have, there's always more. And I think that's just a really, you know, man, many of us are in that kind of state. And I think there's a better state. And instead of kind of looking outside for everything, rarely do we actually look inside. For the answer and that's what we do in real-time leadership so one of the things that we really focus on is helping become people become not just better leaders but even better humans and also leading more fulfilling lives so for us 
That means really examining your character strengths and your personal values, the things that truly do mean the most for you, and then understanding where you want to grow as a human and really cultivating those aspects. So we actually think a lot of the answer lies within. I really appreciate that. And I find it ironic that I, I, I'd never heard that term, the hungry ghost, but the coffee shop where I go every morning is called Hungry Ghost Coffee. Ah, there you go. And yes, I know it. I know that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you're just putting me as the guy who went from three to 2.9 on his FOMO <laughs> scale and now dr gets the coffee. It's just all synchronicity. It's like the universe right. is sending me a message about focusing in the new year, which is right. why I have you here. Your new book is called Real-Time Leadership, Finding Your Winning Moves When the Stakes Are High. And so I cracked the spine on this one, or the, you know, it's a PDF these days. Um, and uh, you start the book with a quote, which spoke to me because uh, early in the pandemic, through a recommendation of a friend, I ordered this book called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And I've talked about this book before, all you FOMO sapiens, you guys have heard me exhort you to read this book. It's, it's like eating cheese. You can only have a little bit every day, but at the end, it's highly, uh, I guess, caloric in a good way. And you have this quote uh, that says, quote, in between every stimulus and response, there is a space, and in that space is our freedom to choose. So that's how you start the book. Carol, talk about how that frames up this conversation about real-time leadership. Thank you. It's a very powerful quote. And what it is, is it's about making the most of every moment. And there's thousands of moments that sort of flip by us every, every day. And how do we make the most of them? And how do we find that space between what's thrown at us, the stimulus, what's thrown at us, and our response? How do you make that space? Then how do you make that space bigger but then how can you be smarter about using that space? You know, whether you're a young country or you're a person, when you have freedom, you have to learn how to make your own choices and to figure out how to go forward. And the book does double and triple and quadruple clicks on that in all the ways that we can make space for ourselves and then how to use it wisely. FOMO. FOMO. Now, as I as I think about that, you know, uh, there's a I'm going to paraphrase badly, but Churchill talks about the fact that you should never waste a good crisis, right? But you know, David, I'm wondering. It feels like, I mean, the definition of crisis these days is, you know, it's it feels like we're lurching from one to the next. So maybe it's always been that way. So I don't want to just sort of, you know, ground ourselves in the last three years. But I think you could go back to the you know, the 1700s, probably people's day-to-day -day lives are a lot tougher. But it's easy to think about the big crises and then there's the day-to-day -day crises. So as you frame up this, you know, real-time leadership, are you thinking more about like pandemic, Ukraine uh, attack, you know, by Russia? Or are you thinking about, you know, didn't hit the sales projection? Like how do you frame up th the level of crisis that you're trying to manage through? Well, Patrick, it's all of those things. It's the things that matter most to you. So mm. um, certainly what's happening in the Ukraine can affect you personally in terms of how you're relating to the world or connecting to the world or feeling about the world, but it can also have an impact on your job and your career. Um, equally, if you miss a sales forecast, that could be one of the most important things in your life right now. So what, what Carol was talking about when creating space, the reason we need to create space is that day to day, we're all really good at making the most of every moment in familiar situations, right? Like we've all built this great pattern recognition over time, whether it's in our um, home life or whether it's in our work life. So if you see X happen and then you see Y happen, you instantly know that you need to do Z. But that's for familiar stuff and that's all built in the past. And what happens when you face like a new type of crisis that you haven't seen before, or even a new, big opportunity, like some 10x opportunity that's coming at you that's of a scale and scope that you've never seen before, that's where you have to play a different game. And that's where you have to overcome your reflexes because your reflexes could actually hurt you really badly on that. And when you when you think about the um, what we've all been playing at and those big macro issues that you, you've raised, um, leaders and just individual contributors as well for the last few years have been playing catch up on everything. So we've had to pivot to respond to 
COVID, changing nature of the workforce, social issues, armed conflict, inflation, supply chain, destroy, you know, all those things. And we got to stop playing catch up. So real time leadership is about how do you anticipate what's next? Because there is going to be something next in 2023. And we want you to be able to get ahead of the curve. So we help to show you how to do that. So I guess if I was to, yeah, I guess what I'm getting from you is everybody has their toolkit that they go to on a daily basis. And you have, you know, the usual kind of, it's it's like, uh, you know, it's like, you know, doing yoga or something and that you know the patterns. And then if you're doing yoga on, if you've ever done it like on a block or something where you, you all of a sudden you don't have, you're standing on something that doesn't have the same um, level of stability, you have to completely change up your game or you're going to fall over, um, as I often do. So you cannot go back to the same tool. You have to mix it up. You have to find something new. And that's what the entire book is about. Is that is that a fair way of, of, of describing the work that you've done in the book? Love that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Fair. Okay, good. <laughs> so let's get into this. You have a methodology, M-O-V-E, move, and it's got four steps to it. Um, M, be mindfully alert. O, generate options. V, validate your vantage point. And E, engage and affect change. I'd love to jump into, I mean, we won't get through all of them because, you know, if we did, then people wouldn't buy the book. So, you know, FOMO sapiens, <laughs> we can only give you enough to generate the FOMO. But uh, I want to start, <laughs> Carol, with you. Why don't you pick one of those four from your methodology and give us an example from you know your experience coaching uh, high high impact leaders about how how this can play out what is if this methodology is implemented how a leader can really you know move the needle okay great um i'll go with um i'll i'll go with oh generating great. options so what that is is What's it based on? It starts out with our reflexes. You know, we need to learn how to, you know, defy our default, rise above our reflexes. But what are our reflexes? So our core reflexes are, you know, we all know fight and flight. There's also freeze. And there's also befriend, um, which is an actual reflex. You know, if you see a toddler about to be run over by a truck, you don't think, oh, should I, you know, you grab them. Okay, so now under not life and death situations, I, I think of it as how do, when, when, when a stimulus comes our way, okay, so someone has, say, betrayed you, or, you know, you discover they're a supporter of someone you find horrifying, that's the stimulus that comes at you, you catch it, what do you do? So we've translated fight, flight, freeze, and befriend into do you lean in and really engage, do you lean back and don't go for the conflict, but go for the data and the overview? Do you lean with and really think about what does this person need, you know, or nurturance on a bigger level culture? And then the hardest one is to not lean at all, to have the discipline, to have something thrown at you and have the resolve to be able to do nothing. So I kind of came up with this idea many years ago with a client and he had a boss who had been a dear friend and was now the scourge of his existence. You know, he would have meetings at, with her at the end of the day so he could go home and be given a drink. And um, so he's talking about this and he's leaning in, you know, this and that about her and, and I'm right there. We got to come up with a plan. Then he says, you know, and then she starts like confiding in me and I'm like, oh my God, that's so sociopathic. Thank goodness I didn't say anything. But all of a sudden I went, I've caught it. I'm only leaning in. I'm only supporting him in this lean in stance. So I then leaned back and said, hey, wait, let's look at the overview. You know, let's back up. Let, what, what, what's the bigger context? And then we find out that she's being torpedoed by the board and a bunch of other stuff like that. So that was sort of the leaning back. Then um, I skipped to don't lean at all. And this was a scary question. Because I said, well, you know, even though she took your, you know, 10 million for her pet project and this and that, you always get what you want in the end. Anyway, so why does it even bother you? I was afraid that would really upset him. But it was like, oh, but he still didn't feel like he was about to get that meeting and feel comfortable in it. And we then talked about leaning with. And I asked the question, what would it be like if your entire goal in your next meeting with her was for her to feel better at the end of that meeting? And for that, it just, that is what he wanted. He remembered, oh, right, we've been friends. Oh, right, she's under all this pressure. Um, 
I actually care about her. And so it was helpful on two levels, one for him, but the other for me, that in order for me to be able to do that, I had to practice it and make sure that I could lean back, lean with, or not lean myself. I'm wondering, you know, I'm just thinking about my own experiences in the world of human relations. And like, you have these two people who clearly care about each other. You have these people that are able to, in some ways, very effectively work with each other. But yet, in this situation, clearly something isn't going well. And I'm curious, for your client who is having all this agita around, you know, his relationship with his boss, like, how much of that do you think was, if you were to like, be a fly on the wall and observe these observations, how much do you think of it was actually happening versus how much of it do you think was coming, he was sort of projecting in his own mind and creating dynamics that maybe didn't even exist in the first place? Okay, I'm going to give you a very short answer. And then this okay. is such a lead in for David, perhaps to talk about vantage point. Because okay. um, in this situation, in this situation, I sort of knew he was right, because I was doing a lot of work in the organization. And I had actually interviewed her as well. So I, you know, what's, what's great about leadership coaching versus when mm. you're a, a therapist or counselor is you actually know the truth. But mm. the biggie is, is what he's saying to me right? Or is his vantage point off? Oh, I like that. And, and so this is, we're going to switch. If you don't mind, David, you've just been called out. And it reminds me, there's a great movie called I Heart Huckabees, which I watched in a formative time of my life. And it's the theme of the movie is how almost all human drama is self-created. You know, our lives are dramas that you're the star of your own movie and sort of, so even like if you have a kind of a boring life, you will like in your head, because you know, you only have, you have information asymmetry driving your entire existence that you'll cook up things. Um, and maybe it's true, maybe it's not, and it's hard to know. And so we've just called you out on Vantage Point. Talk about that particular aspect of this entire sort of move mindset. Sure, Patrick, that's that's actually a great lead in in terms of being the star of your own movie. So um, mm. Carol and I would say, and this is, this is kind of a classic coaching technique, um, you may think you're the star of your own movie, but imagine going to the balcony and watching you performing in this. That's what you need to do to get some objectivity and perspective on things. And that's what Vantage Point is all about, because we work with um, we work with a retired four star general who's an amazing leader. And he says his best quote for us is uh, I fight the war I have, not the war I want. And that's just like a tremendous perspective on seeing reality for what it is and not what you hope or fear it might be. And the thing is, we, we all have these distortions as well as blind spots. Like my, my personality projects lots of things on how I see the world and other people. My belief system, my personal values, my assumptions, um, the data that I choose to look at or the quality of the data that I've got, the frameworks that I use for my analysis. So all of those things can distort reality from what it really is or actually just create blind spots for me. So what you want to do, because the faster that you can see reality or as close to reality as you possibly can, uh, that actually gives you an advantage, uh, both in life as well as in your career. So the question to ask yourself is like, hmm, where am I exaggerating or discounting threats or opportunities that I, I see? That's a big question. And then also, like, am I completely missing the point? So an example might be, uh, I'm going to go in guns blazing to this meeting because I need this project approved. And that's my objective for this meeting. And then you ask yourself, like, well, what am I missing? It's like, oh, maybe I'm missing the fact that no one else has had an opportunity to weigh in on this. And I need to give the team a chance to voice themselves so that I can come to a better quality decision. We'll get more alignment and it'll happen the next time. So that's just a, a mild example of seeing reality for what it is. But this is one of the most powerful things that you can do. And it's a good check before you engage in a major decision, take any action or any interaction. It's just like, am I really seeing reality? FOMO. FOMO. This makes me think about a topic that I think doesn't get enough play. And I want to ask each of you about this because I just see this pervasive lack of self-awareness. Let's think about, let's think about the people who fill our headlines every day. 
I always pick on Elon Musk um, because it's so easy. But, you know, the lack of self-awareness of somebody like him, but also, you know, we don't even have to go to those stratospheric heights to find people who have, you know, they've moved up in their careers, they've done well. And now, you know, as the, I think we're going to start seeing a reckoning where people whose ideas were not that great, but could still raise money or, you know, everything was up and to the right. As you start to hit reality and, and the economy slows down and things are harder and things like crypto, you know, they'll fall back to earth. Like a lot of people who looked like really smart and everybody sort of just agreed with them. Now the cold, harsh light of reality shines in the window and those people have not really had to be all that self-aware. I mean, some have done, but lots of them haven't been self-aware. And so when you are working with somebody like that, either as a client or as a coach or as an employee or team member, like how does one, or just as yourself, like how does one cultivate self-awareness? I'm going to start with you, Carol. Okay. Oh. So... When, um, it's like when you look in the mirror, what do you see, you know, and mm -hmm. have you made your mirror be all nice and pink and rosy? And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, everything is very clear. One of the things I think about, though, is that um, narcissism is expensive. You know, mm -hmm. it can really ruin your life and hurt the people around you. So very often, some people, um, their journey to be self to become self aware requires a jolt. You know, we they're in pre-contemplation. They really don't see they have an issue. For that group, sometimes education helps. We can think of DEI, for example. Sometimes mm -hmm. education helps. Sometimes it needs confrontation. So there's a lot of ways that um, David and I will work with one of these very self-involved, self-important leaders. And what they need is a positive confrontation mm -hmm. in terms of what can inspire them to look at themselves. But what you have to do first, if you're going to confront someone, you don't really deserve to do that unless you care about them. So if you want to help someone be self-aware, you have to cross the bridge to where they are. You need to be able to know their story as they do mm -hmm. with some leaning with, you know, and see the world as they do. Then go back to the bridge and back up step by step. See how they will naturally come with you. And then when you care, you then are able to do a confrontation, sometimes super easy one. Like they'll say something, here's the big confrontation. Really? You think that's a good idea? You know, or is that who you want to be? Is that mm. really who you want to be in this situation? So you can mm. have these small questions that can really begin to shine a light. But when someone's in turmoil, it's a very, very good time to begin that journey. Wow. What I love about that, I'm just going to comment because I'm, I'm, I'm actually just getting free advice from you on a current situation is that that's not confrontational at all. And as it, it's just, it's just questioning in a way that opens a door to having a, the person self-examine. And so that actually like, that's pretty masterful. I love that. David, <laughs> now that you know I need advice, what would be your, um, what would be your thought on that so everything that carol and i do is um focused on being practical and it's also stuff mm. that we've also applied to our own lives so one thing that really features in our work is mindfulness and it's mindfulness in a particular fashion so when you think about the popular definition which we can use for here of mindfulness it's about being aware of what's happening sort of around inside you but also aware of what's happening inside you and being able to accept that in a non-judgment so that you can just see reality for what it is and then act accordingly. Easier said than done. So one of the things that we do that's very practical to increase self-awareness about our clients' individual feelings or emotions is this quick little exercise. So you can do it at home. Um, and this is something that just, you know, rocked my world because I used to be a senior banker. And when I started to coach, I had to Google feelings. Um, so I figured it out. Yeah. And this is like a way to, to kind of do it. So question, four questions. First question is on a scale of one to 10, how calm are you right now? 10 being very calm. You don't have to answer. Just like think about it. Second question is scale of one to 10. Clear as you're thinking right now. 
10 is like super clear. One is like fuzzy. I don't know what's going on. Like I'm just in a little bit of a fog. All fine. It's just what's the, what's the answer that reflects your true state right now? Third question is, um, how curious are you on a scale of one to 10? 10 is like, well, I'm curious about everything. I want to learn about myself, other people, different ideas, different perspectives, learn how to get better. One is like, not so much. I think I've got my point of view. And the last question, which is in two parts, is how compassionate are you right now towards yourself first and then towards others that are around you? Those kind of four things together, they're sort of in your head. It's like curiosity and clarity of thought. And then in your heart is compassion, and then your body is calm. So it's just this very integrated perspective on where you're at right now. Just naming that stuff can actually help to settle you and help to create that space that we talked about between something that's thrown at you and how you react to it. I like that because I think some people would say, oh, well, that sounds very soft. But when you say it, I think about it, I'm like, that's courageous. That's strong. Mm -hmm that's leadership. And I think a lot of us have learned that that's the case in the last couple of years. Now, I want to end up our sort of finish our conversation by talking a little bit about the way that you two work, because when you start, I was reading the book, you work together, you're coaching clients together, which I think some people always think of a coach as sort of like a one-on-one kind of thing. So talk about how, what, the benefits of, of working together on a coach, uh, on a coaching client. Let's start with you, Carol. Sure. Well, one of the things I learned from David is that, because he comes from a background of being a managing partner in strategy firms, a banker, CEO of a digital bank. So he comes from one angle. You know, I come from the angle of being a clinical psychologist, teaching at Harvard, leadership coach. So when we're talking to someone like we were both coaching you together, we'd have a very different sort of slant on what would be useful for you. And one of the things David shared with me once is that if you're a big time CEO and you want some help on your strategy, one little strategist doesn't walk into the room. You know, you have a bunch of them. So if you've got a major CEO in a super complex situation that is moving fast and he's got personality issues to boot, why have just one resource? So we'll work together. And again, we come from these very different vantage points, which gives a much more three-dimensional picture to the person. And we ask And you're in the in room at the same time. You're sitting all there, all the three of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. And David, what, what's your take on all this? So um, you can tell already from this podcast that we're two very different people. So that also mm. adds some complementarity in the work that we do. So... Um, you know, if I happen to miss something, it's likely that Carol's going to pick up on it. And if Carol misses something, it's likely I'm going to pick up on it so we can be a better service um, to our clients. So just to be clear, we don't do this all the time together. We reserve this for the most complex, highest stakes mm -hmm. possible issues. It's like it's expensive. <laughs> it's involved. So mm -hmm. we're not always working together, but we always supervise each other in terms of exchanging ideas on how best to serve a client. So what... A quick example, just very fast example, is um, Carol was working with a new CEO, and um, he was having a problem regulating himself, basically. He was having fights with his team, storming out of meetings and things like that. And then I was working in another part of the organization, happened to coincide that we all met in the office one day. And Carol was coaching him about, like, is this who you want to be? Um, who do you want to be? How can you be that person? And I just asked him a question, like, what are you trying to get done? And he answered me about this organizational design that he wanted to do. And then we just started to take it apart about like, what were the conditions of success for change in that organizational redesign? Did you communicate it in the right way? Did you get alignment and buy-in? Did you provide the right incentives? No. So we basically unpacked it a different way. So that allowed him to focus on a new approach. And then Carol could refine how she was working on the leadership part as well. So that just really showed our complementarity and by mm -hmm. working together on something. Yeah. And it happened by accident, by the way. We didn't come up with yeah. this. I was in that office, had glass walls, and I saw David striding by. And I'm like, wait, 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 David, come on in. And then the magic happened. We, we really would not have come up with it without that serendipitous moment. 
So everybody, the book is called Real-Time Leadership, Find Your Winning Moves When the Stakes Are High. And if you want to find out more about Carol and David's work, you can go to rtlinstitute.com. That's short for Real-Time Leadership Institute. And I have a special request, which is go out and buy a hard copy of the book and help them achieve their lifelong dream of hitting the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list. That's a small ask to make for such nice people. All right, everybody. Once again, my guests today are Carol Kaufman and David Noble. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO.